In this lesson, we are going to configure our Black Pill Board's microcontroller. To configure a microcontroller means we will be preparing it to use the peripherals for use by our code. There is actually a whole lot more to the configuration that happens in the background, but thankfully we have ST's Cube MX configuration tool built into the ST IDE to do most of these complex configurations for us based upon some basic information we provide. Some of the basics the configuration tool will require to know is what specific microcontroller are we using? This will be our target. Is the clock going to refer to an internal clock or an external one? How fast is the system clock going to run? Which peripherals do we need to use? Which pins would we prefer they connect to? What clock speeds will these require? What protocol, data size, and other parameters will it require? Will they require any interrupt? Once we have determined what we have, what we need, and where we need it, we will be at a point that we can generate the code and open our project in the IDE so we can begin programming the microcontroller for our needs. Let's go ahead and open up the STM32Cube IDE application. It's asking if I want to use this as the directory workspace. I'm going to go ahead and keep that one and launch it. And now here's the IDE. Let's go up here. In the upper left corner, there's a little window with a plus sign up there and an arrow pointing down next to it. Don't click on the window, click on the arrow. When you click on the arrow, you should see this list here. We want to click on STM32 project. It's going to take quite a while to load up this target selector, so please be patient. Again, just please wait. It's not done yet. Okay. If you get to this point, it should be ready. Now, I do want to point out, if you have one of these annoying little windows that says updates available, and you try to click it, and you get that little bell sound, that means it's not going to let you close it yet. In fact, I'm going to have to go through several windows before I can get rid of this little guy. Let's continue on. As before in the previous video, we clicked on STM32F4 under the MCU MPU selector. We don't need to use board or example or cross selector, just the MCU MPU selector. So when we click on the STM32F4 family, we are narrowed down to the STM32F4 chips. Let's scroll down to STM32F411CE and click on that one. Notice that the first one is CEUX. The second one is CEUY. The one we want is CEUX. Over here on the right, you can see it's a 512 kilobyte flash, 128 kilobyte SRAM, 36 pins, and clocked at 100 megahertz. We've already covered some of the tabs that we have available to us up here regarding features, block diagram, documents and resources, and data sheets. We're not going to go over that this time. We're just going to go ahead and come down here and click Next. Now it's prompting us to give this project a name. I'm going to go ahead and call this BP underscore synth dash init. You can call it whatever you want. That's just what I'm going to call it for now. I'm going to use the default location, which is the workspace. Targeted language is C. Targeted binary type executable. Project type STM32 cube. Just go ahead and click finish. It'll take a moment for it to create some startup code for us. What it's going to do is put together some files and folders over here on the left. And this is like a basic bare bones project already put together for us to use. So when I finally get to this screen, 
I can go ahead and go down here to this annoying little updates available box and click that sucker out of here. I just want to quickly show over here on the left what it generated for us. Click on core, click on source, here's the main.c file. Double click that. It's going to ask if we want to open up the file extension with the C++ perspective. Go ahead and click yes. These little windows over here is the perspective that it was speaking of. Here's our main.c file. Over here we can maximize this screen in the middle. And what we're looking at here is a bare bones main.c file. And you'll notice that there is absolutely nothing in here but the basic structure for our cube IDE to use. But you'll notice that we have no includes, we have no type defs, we have no defines, we have no macros, we have no private variables. They're not in here. But when we finalize the configuration, it will fill in a lot of the code for us. That's what's so great about this configuration tool. For now, I'm going to maximize this screen. The very first thing you need to configure is the clock. Over here on System Core, RCC is one of the windows where we set up our clock. You'll notice up here it says High Speed Clock HSE and it's disabled. I want to go ahead and click on this tab up here. It's Clock Configuration. I'm going to zoom in on this. And this is how we set up our clock in a graphical user interface here. Right now it's set up for high speed internal. The high speed internal clock runs about 16 megahertz and it will work fine for most cases but our black pill board has a built in crystal clock that can make our timing a lot more accurate. You'll notice HSI here is selected and we cannot select HSE which is high speed external. Let's go back to RCC mode. Click on High Speed Clock HSE and select Crystal Ceramic Resonator. You'll notice that over here a couple pins have turned green. These are the pins our crystal is connected to. Let's go back to Clock Configuration. Now we can see we can click on HSE. Now we're going to go over here to H Clock and change this to 100 MHz. Hit Enter. Then a little box like this should show up. Click OK. And a strange thing happens. This goes back to high speed internal selection again, but it's showing the 100 megahertz. Make sure that you click on high speed external again, and you'll see these boxes turn red. Just click back on here, select that number in the H clock box, and enter 100 megahertz again. All of this should stay the same. There is one thing we may change here in a few minutes and that's the PLLI2S clock. Here where it says X192, we will probably change that to X194. What this is is for our I2S interface clock. But we'll get back to that. Go back to the pins and configuration. The next peripheral we want to set up is inside Connectivity and click on USART2. In Mode, click Asynchronous. In Parameter Settings, you'll see a baud rate. Click on that, select the whole number, and enter 31250. So now we have set the baud rate to 31,250 bits per second. The rest of these parameters can stay as they are. Now we need to go to NVIC settings and where it says USART Global Interrupt, we want to enable it. Now we can see we have two pins over here that have turned green. One is USART Receive, the other is USART 2 Transmit. You may want to go ahead and point out right now the RCC has a warning that came up. It has gone red around a choice called Audio Clock Input. 
The reason why is because we enabled the USART 2 pins. If you click on this USART 2 transmit, you will see the I2S clock in selection right here. This pin is also used for the I2S clock in. And since we're using it for the USART, we can no longer click on this and use this. If I were to disable this, this problem would go away, but we do not need to use the I2S clock in. So we can go ahead and ignore this warning. Let's go ahead and configure our I2S interface. Here under multimedia is I2S1. Now I want you to pay attention up here. SPY1 is going to gray out on us the moment that we select I2S1 and enable it. So go ahead and click I2S1. Up here where it says disable, click and change it to half duplex master. And like I said, SPY1 went gray. That's because I2S1 and SPY1 are pretty much one and the same. Under parameter settings, click on selected audio frequency. Change it to 32 kilohertz. If it doesn't show anything, Try and click it again. Now your settings should show Mode Master Transmit, I2S Philips, 16 bits data on 16 bits frame, 32 kilohertz. And when we get to this part, it says 32.106 kilohertz. And it shows an error between of 0.33%. We can make this percentage even lower if we go to our clock configuration change this 192 to 193 and see what it changes to. Now it's down to 0.16. Let's change it again. Let's change it to 194. Now it says a 0% error and we're pretty much right on 32 kilohertz. So let's keep that selection. The next thing we're going to do is set up our DMA. Click on DMA settings and you'll notice there's nothing in here. Down here at the bottom is an add button. Click on add then under this select window select SPI1TX. This automatically fills in the DMA stream 2, memory to peripheral, priority low. Down here at DMA request settings change mode from normal to circular. Click use FIFO which is first in first out. Threshold should say full. Our data width should be a half word, which means 16 bits. The other one we will also change to half word. And the burst will stay at single. And the memory should have a check mark underneath it. The peripheral should be unchecked. This data width is basically saying we're going to get 16 bits from memory and we're going to send 16 bits out to the peripheral, which is the spy peripheral. Next, we just want to make sure on the NVIC settings that the DMA Stream 2 Global Interrupt is checked. And it should be checked and grayed out so that you can't turn it off. If you'd like, you could take a look at the GPIO settings and you can see pin A4, pin A5, pin A7 is WS for word select, CK for bit clock, and SD for our data stream. You can also see that on the pins over here. A4 is our word select. A5 is our bit clock. And A7 is our data. We're just about done. There is a couple more settings we need to take a look at here. At the top at NVIC, if you'll click that open, NVIC is a list of interrupts and here you can see the USART 2 global interrupt is checked on the DMA stream 2 global interrupt is clicked on we also have something up here called system tick timer which we will discuss later on when we get into the appurgiator but I thought I'd go ahead and mention it up here under code generation we find these three again SysTech timer USART 2 Global Interrupt and DMA Stream 2 Global Interrupt. And you'll see over here we have checked off as a call how handler. 
the handler is going to be some code we use these interrupts with. Let's go back to the main NVIC tab. And by the way, NVIC stands for Nested Vectored Interrupt Controller. That's another type of peripheral inside the ST microcontroller that handles these interrupts for us. Under the NVIC tab, you can see you can click on the interrupts independently. Click on USART 2 Global Interrupt. Down here at the bottom is a preemption priority selection. Make sure that the USART is set at zero. Click on DMA2 Stream and under preemption priority, change that to 13. What we're doing is we're lowering the priority of the DMA stream because that sucker is going to constantly run and it's going to hog up all of the cores time if we don't lower the priority. This is our USART interrupt and when MIDI signals come in we need to be able to capture them as quickly as possible. If the DMA stream isn't letting us capture the signal we won't be able to play any notes. Just to once again go over what we've done these two pins configure the crystal oscillator that will run our system clock very accurately. This USART transmit pin we don't use right now. We could later on send MIDI signals out through this pin, but it's not something we are covering under these lessons. USART receive is the pin we're going to use to connect our MIDI interface to. I2S1WS is our word select clock, and it's on pin A4. I2S1 clock is our bit clock, and it's pin A5. I2S1 SD is our data stream, and it is pin A7. Now I'm going to go ahead and restore this to a windowed version. And now that we're sure we have everything set up the way we want it, up here is a little gold gear, and we're going to click on that. Because when we hover over it, we see it says Device Configuration Tool Code Generation. Go ahead and click Yes. And now that's going to update our code. Now remember, when we first looked at main.c, there was nothing in it. Now we have some private variables, some prototypes. some initialization code, and our functions have changed quite a bit in here for our clock, and we have an I2S configuration, a USART configuration, a DMA configuration, and the configuration did all of this for us quite easily and quite quickly. Let's go over real quick some of the parameters that we set in our configuration tool. Here under the clock we have high speed external. Under peripheral clock selection for I2S you see the number 194 right here. Under the I2S init you see we have an instance here referring to SPY1 we have an I2S mode of master transmit, uses the standard Phillips mode, 16-bit data format, an audio frequency of 32 kilohertz. Down at the UART, we have a baud rate of 31,250, 8-bit word length, and other parameters that were already set for us. Under the DMA initialization, you'll see that we have our DMA interrupt priority is set to 13. If we want to see the interrupt priority for our USART, we need to go to a different file. Over here is the STM32F4 HAL MSP file. Go ahead and scroll on down. to the UART MSINET. And down here is the priority. We set the priority to zero. 
So that covers the basics of how to use the configuration tool to get all the complex startup code and collection of folders and files put together for you in a way that you can immediately start going into programming your project. In the next lesson, we're going to go over what is called a text editor. What I use is called Atom. And it's going to let us go over the code without having to go into all of this between folders up here at the top or on the side here. Instead, Atom will let us have several different views at one time. So I'll see you in the next lesson.